Good morning, church. Good to see you guys. Um, good to be back, actually. Um, uh, it's Wednesday night, some, I think 2021 or something, shortly after Pastor Shane and I met. And he, you were not in town, and I was like, I get to speak at Pastor Shane's church. You know? I was like, talk about a man among men. You know what I mean? Like a, a man with a chest, actually. Um, in, in an age and in a society and in a culture in evangelicalism in the church where actually we have most men without chest who are leading the blood-bought bride of Christ in America. You see, they're like Lot in Genesis, and they'll only speak as much truth as the spirit of the age allows them to, lest they lose their 501c3 status or are not invited to Davos to speak at the World Economic Forum. That's, so like the lines actually couldn't be clearer, the lines of demarcation in the church could actually not be any clearer. And so this morning, what I want to share with you is basically Lot versus Gideon. It, this is actually the testing point for the, the man, the pastor, the shepherd, and the church in America today is which way Christian man in our culture of death out of control, totally insane. Yeah. Like what in the world is going on? If I told you some of the stuff happening right now would be happening right now in 2009, you would have laughed me out of even Saddleback Church. You, you, I mean, like, you would have been like, this guy is a kooky, weirdo conspiracy theorist. That This guy's just trying to rile the church up into a frenzy um, so, that they'll, that, that, so that they'll donate to his nonprofit. This guy's just a sensationalist communicator. And, well, things happen gradually, then suddenly, just like bankruptcy. Right? Let's say, I'm not talking to anyone in the church. I don't know you guys, I, though I love you already. But, um, but let's say you, you made some bad financial decisions. You lost your business or whatever. And you, you go to your wife and you go, babe, I, <laughs> I lost the business. We're bankrupt. I don't know how this happened. <laughs> your wife is probably like, babe, you've been making bad financial decisions for decades. What do you mean you don't know how this happened? This was happening gradually for decades. And now you're bankrupt and you're like, I don't know how this happened. What if I told you the same thing is true of politics, culture, and ideologies or worldviews that they brew, they move gradually, and we don't notice it at the time. We're like, oh, it was the land of the free, the home of the brave, a Christian nation. And then, oh, if you're, if you're over 12, you can get abortion without parental consent in the state of California and charge it to your parents' insurance plans. And the insurance company can't tell the parents that their minor child killed their grandchild and charged it to the insurance company. Oh, right. Yeah, that's a thing in California. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Wiener boy, the, the Democrat um, legislator in California, Scott Wiener. Um, no, 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 no. That's his name. I'm not like, I'm not doing that to get laughs, actually. Like, if you laugh, that's fine. God has a sense of humor, but like, that is his name. Um, and he is behind every piece of new borderline or, or, or completely pedophilic, um, transgender, uh, and then kill the babies uh, legislation in California. And it was him, well, there's many pieces of legislation, but, but it was actually him who led the way in the first kind of bill in the country that's basically transgender child trafficking. Do you, know, do you understand what I'm saying? It's, oh, okay, oh, okay, oh, one of the parents doesn't affirm the uh, gender identity of, of Legion, uh, of, um, uh, of the, their, their son or daughter, um, and they don't want to call them they, them. And so, well, hey, hey, you one parent that's not affirming, um, you're, you're posing a threat to your child's mental health. Um, and you can trust us because follow the science. You can trust the scientific establishments in America. Um, even though they were all on board with the eugenics movement in the first half of the 20th century, of which Margaret Sanger actually helped incite and build in America, the founder of Planned Parenthood, um, all of the scientific organizations that we're now told you can respect and totally trust, all of them believed that it was okay to forcibly sterilize uh, those that were a threat to the gene pool in the first half of, half of the 20th century. I'm talking like snip, snip, or tie your tubes, like the scientific establishment is deciding who gets to have kids and who doesn't. So, oh, they've gotten a few things wrong, but you can totally trust them now. And, uh, and if they decide that one or both parents is posing a mental health threat to their gender-confused child, then they can trans your kid without parental consent. I had this brother, uh, Harrison Tinsley, on my podcast. He lives in Northern California. And uh, he doesn't have full custody to his kid. And the courts continued to give him only 50% custody while his former girlfriend and the mother 
is dressing their five-year-old up in dresses and referring to him by a female name. And, and you're going, um, Seth, I thought, I thought I was coming to Pro-Life Sunday. Uh, Pastor Shane, I don't really like Seth. Um, I just want to be told that babies are really precious. They're really sweet, and we shouldn't kill them. Um, and this doesn't sound like a Pro-Life Sunday. Um, brothers and sisters, did you know, as of the end of 2023, Planned Parenthood announced that they were the second largest provider of cross-sex hormones and puberty blockers in the land of the free and the home of the brave. Hey, Seth, stay in your lane. Planned Parenthood doesn't. For them, they actually see this thing as a revolution where all the various tentacles of the Leviathan are all connected. So what do they call abortion? Reproductive health care or rights? What do they call... um? surgeries that mutilate the genitals of individuals who want to try to become the other gender. What do they call it? Gender-affirming healthcare. So they call both the mutilation of babies in the womb and the mutilation of people outside the womb healthcare. By the way, abortion is not healthcare because pregnancy is not a disease and babies aren't tumors. You can go tweet that to Anthony Fauci. But are you seeing my point? Like Planned Parenthood, the largest, best-funded, and most profitable 501c3 in human history. Planned Parenthood, the largest, best-funded, and most profitable nonprofit organization in human history, is the second largest provider of cross-sex hormones and puberty blockers, and they're the number one abortion provider in the world. Why do the architects of the culture of death not stay in their lane? Because they follow their father who has been after a total global revolution the entire time. Uh, brothers and sisters, the, the father of lies, Beelzebub, the enemy of our souls, he wants kings. He wants emperors. He wants kingdoms. He actually wants a great commission. It's just the inversion. He wants his disciples to go to the uttermost, to the very ends of the earth, discipling them in an alternative religion. You see, all human conflict is ultimately theological. All human conflict is ultimately theological. We can't get away from the spiritual aspects and spiritual dimensions of the quote-unquote culture war. But we've been told for so many years by our theological betters to just preach the gospel. Guys, this is a new idea in Christendom. This idea that we'll preach salvation of souls, but, but, but apparently God's ideas, they're big enough to save souls, but not societies. Apparently God's ideas, are, are, they're beautiful enough to redeem you from your sins, but, but God's ideas aren't really that great actually for running like countries and civilizations and how things ought to operate. Most of our theological betters in the church today functionally live like that. They say, we'll preach the word of God but, but you, you, you keep your gospel in the church. So when pastors like Shane, and Jack Hibbs, and Rob McCoy, Mike McClure, Calvary Chapel San Jose, that city's been suing him for like $3 million for opening his church in 2020. While the abortion clinics, strip clubs, and weed dispensaries were open and deemed essential services. They, 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 they say that these pastors have missed their great commission evangelistic responsibilities and duties because, oh, you, you got political. You got political. You, you're, you're about the business of the GOP now rather than your father. Really? What a bifurcation of the great commission. Go to the very ends of the earth discipling, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them. <laughs> oh, yeah. The second part of the Great Commission that, that, that Rick Warren has always conveniently dropped out. And teaching them to obey. Oh, to obey. All that I have commanded you. All of it. Raise up the next generation of the sons and daughters of God to be salty again, to preach the full counsel of God. If, if the greatest former fetus who has ever existed entered human history in a uterus that he once knit together to redeem mankind from his sins and then predicts and pulls off his own resurrection, then everything he says is true. Everything he says matters. 
And that event, the the resurrection of the God-man, gives you lenses through which to understand, make sense of all of the insanity in this world and your duty and obligation in a culture of death. You know, I think about the sons of Issachar in 1 Chronicles. And it's really interesting. There's only one line about the sons of Issachar. It's the only thing we know about them. It says, it says and the sons of Issachar were men who understood the times. And so they knew what Israel ought to do. That's, that's all that we know about the sons of Issachar. So with an understanding of the times you live in, comes a responsibility and duty to act and to lead the people of God and the bride of Christ into godly Christian resistance in an insane culture where Gavin Newsom, American psycho governor, (laughs) is putting billboards in pro-life states advertising California's willingness to pay for their abortions if they come to the once great golden state and on those billboards that he was using your tax dollars to put in pro-life states, he had the cojones to quote the words of your Savior. These were pro-abortion billboards saying, love your neighbor as yourself. So come. Come for, for Moloch has his arms stretched wide. One of my best friends and actually my, my, my coordinator of resistance and activism now at the White Rose Resistance, his name's A.J. Hurley. He's a pro-life hero. He exposed partial birth abortions happening illegally in Washington, D.C. right before uh, Roe got overturned. Him and his wife held 115 children who had been aborted because the waste management driver who goes to abortion centers to get the children, he didn't know he was picking up children. He thought he was picking up like gauze or like surgical waste. So he gave these pro-lifers boxes of babies who had been aborted in Washington, D.C. And five of them were full term and their heads were collapsed in, which only happens through partial birth abortions. Uh, Just if you want to know what that is, think about what it's called. Partially birth, partial birth abortion, which breaks federal law. And him and his wife held these children, photographed them and exposed it to the world about eight weeks before Roe v. Wade got overturned. And uh, my brother AJ puts it like this. Two saviors, two sacrifices, two bloodsheds, both with their arms stretched wide for you to come. Moloch has his arms stretched wide saying, give me your children, place them on my hands and I will give you the world. Your crops will grow. Your fertility will be blessed. Your financial situation will improve. Maybe you'll even live a little bit longer. But the God man who enters human history in a uterus to redeem mankind from their sins also stretches his arms wide and says, come also sacrifices himself. You see, actually, the solution to child sacrifice, as my brother AJ says, is a child sacrifice, actually. It's the God-man who becomes a fetus and identifies with you at your most vulnerable stage, the prenatal stage, takes on fetal flesh, This is why the overturning of Roe versus Wade, my brothers and sisters, was so providential. It was so beautiful. We had been praying for this wicked decision in the high places to be overturned, and yet when it was, most pastors didn't say thank you from the pulpit the following Sunday. Most churches didn't have a worship session to thank their Savior for this wonderful victory. Nearly every conservative Christian I met in the months leading up to the overturning of Roe versus Wade, told me it's not going to get overturned. We've been let down too many times by weak, supposed conservative Supreme Court justices. And that's true. John Roberts is like, that should be like a curse word in Christianity. Like you John Roberts did, right? Like you, you Russell Moore did, you Rick Warren did. You know, like, 
and yet of all the victories we could have won coming out of the insanity of 2020 and 2021. Did you know, June 24th, 2022, the day that Roe v. Wade got overturned, in the church calendar is the nativity of St. John the Baptist. <clears throat> now, let's just be honest for a second as Protestants. <laughs> we suck at the church calendar. It's okay to give the Catholics a win every once in a while. Did you know that we actually have Christian festivals and like, you know, like things that help orient our faith historically in salvation history? Like we have Christian festivals and celebrations in the church calendar and most evangelicals are like, it's, it's what? We know more about like June LGBTQIA LMNOP, my name is Legion Month, th than we do about our own historic Christian festivals. Some of y'all missed that one. June 24th, 2022, the day that Roe v. Wade got overturned. Every year, June 24th is the Nativity of St. John the Baptist. Go Google it right now. Put in Nativity of St. John the Baptist, June 24th. What is the Nativity of St. John the Baptist? Huh? It's when we celebrate Mary going to visit her cousin Elizabeth. And when she goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth, because they're both pregnant and they want to have tea together to celebrate what God's doing in their life, the prenatal John the Baptist, little voice in the wilderness, little prenatal John the Baptist starts doing backflips in the uterus because he recognizes the humanity and divinity of his prenatal deity savior in Mary's womb. But because God and his life together in the womb, Psalm 139, fearfully and wonderfully made, God and his life together in the womb, and that is God in the womb, because Jesus is not fully God and fully human from the moment of birth. Jesus is fully God and fully human from the moment of conception. Follow the science. That's when human life begins. So therefore, you, the, the prenatal deity, second member of the Trinity, God, man, who once breathed out the Milky Way, laughed animals into existence, dropped oceans, and then made you as the peak and pinnacle of his creation, more valuable than anything else he has made. And so he gives you dominance and dominion over the creation he has made to be stewards of, fill the earth and subdue it, be fruitful and multiply. The first commandment is to, ha is to make more babies, actually, and raising them in the godly stewardship and admin of the Lord, and so the prenatal deity, the second member of the Trinity, God, man, is now a fetus in Mary's womb, so that's God in the womb, and so you've got the prenatal deity, fetal Christ, knitting the prenatal John the Baptist together in the womb, while he, he is in the womb, while he knits himself together in the womb of a woman whose uterus he once knit together, when he knit together Mary in the womb of Mary's mother. So that's called the incarnation. Have you ever heard of it? It goes by another name, Christianity. It's the arrival of the long awaited, expected and prophesied savior. Think about that. Who does not enter human history as a 30 year old man. He could have. He chooses to enter our time and space and dirt in a process he really reveres, a process he considers holy, conception, gestation, childbirth. Wow. To be a pro-choice Christian, therefore, is to commit a Christological heresy. To be a pro-choice Christian who celebrates and defends the slaughter of babies in the womb would be to maintain that Christ was at some point fully God, but not fully human. First service, that was too much for you, huh? Take another sip of coffee. <laughs> to sanction the slaughter of babies in the womb while claiming the name of Christ, the greatest former fetus who ever existed, who entered human history in a uterus to redeem mankind from their sins, is to maintain that Christ was at some point fully God, but not fully human. Because what is the theology of the incarnation? That the God-man took on humanity. Fully God and fully human. From when? When, Pastor Shane? Was he fully God and fully human at the moment of birth? Does the birth canal confer personhood? Is it a magical birth canal? <laughs> Is there a fetus fairy that sprinkles magical personhood conferring fairy dust on children in that six inch journey from womb to the doctor's hands? It's magical. Wait, so, so if, if he's fully God and fully human, when was he fully God and fully human? From the moment of conception. Follow the science, Anthony Fauci. Human life begins at the moment of conception. So to support the murder of babies in the womb and call on the name of Christ is to celebrate Mary's right to 
to murder your Savior. There's no other way around it. I'm not going to pull my punches this morning to make you feel more comfortable. This ain't Saddleback. Okay, this ain't Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. Don't worry, we're getting to Lot and Gideon in one second. Two options. Which way, Christian man, in the culture of death? Two examples, two different men. Both face their own culture war. Both live very differently. Don't worry, we're getting there. Of all the days that Roe v. Wade could have gotten overturned, it got overturned on the day in the church calendar when we celebrate two unborn babies, <laughs> one of whom is God. What a coinkadink of the 365 days that Roe could have gotten overturned. Huh. Oh, and then there was a planetary alignment in the night sky that evening. June 24, 2022. Now, really pause really quick before you guys are like, Pastor Shane, he's telling us to read the stars. <laughs> uh, I'm not, okay, I'm not Beth Moore. Like, I'm not into that, like, really weird. Okay, don't read the stars, okay? But I'm just saying, there was a planetary alignment, and the last one had been, like, 2001. And now it's 2022. Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Venus, and one other. All visible in the night sky in one photo to the stargazer by the naked eye. The, the evening that Roe v. Wade got overturned. And so then this, this um, photo went viral by an astrophotographer. Have you ever even met an astrophotographer? Who took the photo of a viral planetary alignment picture, and it goes viral. I mean, like, all around the world, not just America. Because it was amazing. It was gorgeous. It was like right after twilight, or right twilight, right after sunset. Like all five planets. <laughs> the name of the astrophotographer who took the picture of the viral planetary alignment on the day that Roe v. Wade got her returned. His name was Wright Dobbs. Does anyone know the name of the Supreme Court decision that had overturned Roe v. Wade that morning? It was Dobbs. It's spelled D-O-B-B-S. It was called Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. That was actually the legal official name of the Supreme Court decision that was the overturning of Roe versus Wade. Have you ever met someone with the last name Dobbs? Okay, D-O-B-B-S. The dude's last name is literally the name of the Supreme Court decision that overturned Roe v. Wade that morning. And his first name's Wright. Like, Wright. Wright Dobbs. Chalk it up to another coinkadink. Another coinkadink. Have you ever heard it said that providence is when God winks? Right? As if to say, I'm still here. Now fulfill your duty to your king. Aslan is on the move, brothers and sisters. And when Aslan's on the move, it would do you well to join him on that field of battle. For you will find rest for your souls and strength in time of need. We've been missing out on the greatest adventure which is to simply be obedient and watch how God uses us. Is that not the greatest adventure? It's not to wait for the pregnancy centers to do the work that God's called his local church to do. By the way, my mother directed a pregnancy resource center while pregnant with me. Okay, I've been a pro-life activist since I was a fetus. Okay, long time. I love pregnancy centers. But we have been allowing 501c3s to do the work that God's called the blood-bought bride of Christ to do in America. And I'm saying that as the CEO of a 501c3. I think there are too many 501c3s in America because the work they do, while important, of course, used to be taken up by the local church. Did you know that abortion, exposure, child sacrifice, and other forms of infanticide, more often than not, were both legal and respectable in pagan societies from the earliest times? My, doctor, my mentor, Dr. George Grant, says, you know, unwanted children in ancient Rome were abandoned outside the city walls to die from exposure to the elements and from the attacks of wild foraging beasts. The, the, the Greeks would give pregnant women heavy doses of herbal and medicinal abortifacients. The Persians developed highly sophisticated surgical curette procedures. Ancient Hindus and Arabs concocted uh, chemical pessaries that were pushed or pumped directly into the womb through the birth canal. The primitive Canaanites threw their children onto great flaming pyres 
as a sacrifice to their god Moloch. The Polynesians subjected their pregnant women to onerous tortures, their abdomens beaten with heavy stones and hot coals heaped upon their bodies. Oh yeah, and then the Egyptians disposed of their unwanted children, especially little girls, by uh, uh, disemboweling and dismembering them. And their collagen was then ritually harvested for the manufacture of cosmetic creams. The more things change, the more they stay the same. There are cosmetic creams in America today in the 21st century that are made with aborted baby tissue and cells. There's nothing new under the sun, church. When we talk about the killing of babies, we're not even talking about a unique kind of evil. Killing babies in the womb is not a new idea. Please stop thinking that we're dealing with some, some new, innovative, progressive idea called abortions in America. No! Killing children inside and outside the womb was legal and respectable in almost every pagan society since antiquity. Legal and respectable. It was, it was the early Christians who started changing this idea that human beings were just uh, to be used. This idea that made, wow, there's the sanctity of life. That you're created in the image of God. Maybe, maybe women shouldn't be able to be treated as the property of their husbands. Like maybe children are actually persons with rights. Do you understand? Like, do you know your history? If a baby was born and there was something wrong with them, not only was it like okay to dispose of that child, do you know it was expected? I don't know if you know your history. Like, it was expected that you would just discard a child that had something wrong with them or wasn't the right gender that you wanted and try again. None of this is new. The only thing that's new is the silence of the blood-bought bride of Christ. Do you know why the early church was so ethnically diverse? All this talk about critical race theory and I'm white and so I participate in systems of oppression because of dint of my skin color even though my ancestors didn't even come here until after slavery was ended but you're, I still am somehow the problem. Yeah, yeah, sure, let's talk about diversity. Do you want to know why the early church was so ethnically diverse? Because they were rescuing abandoned infants and raising them as their own and in the admonition of the Lord. The history of our faith is that where the gospel was proclaimed, social transformation followed. That the gospel was more than just the message of salvation. It was actually like, oh, because we understand human beings have dignity and value, it should be Christians more than anyone else who are getting involved in politics, in culture building, in order to please our king and to protect the little ones. It's like my pastor Rob McCoy says, the church in America waits downstream to pick up human heartache that they helped create through their political apathy upstream. Things happen gradually, then, Suddenly, those ideologies, ideas, policies, laws, those start somewhere. They don't just go, huh. They start upstream. They get poisoned in the water hole somewhere. They flow downstream. And then we launch our ministries of mercy in the church downstream to solve the broken and hurting individuals who are often the consequences of bad ideas and bad policies. What, what if we went upstream? It's wonderful to offer a post-abortion Bible study to men and women who have killed their children, but you know what's better? Making abortion illegal so they didn't have the choice in the first place. It's wonderful to minister to gender-confused people, some of whom chopped off their own genitals, to help them find their identity again. But do you know what's better? Preventing that evil insanity from happening in the first place. That was the history of the church, is that we were on the forefront, on the front lines of social transformation, because we have a Savior, and his name is the way, the truth, and the life. And if we have the truth, and we're afraid to say it, to defend it, and to praise it, then we are cowards. Uh, R.J. Rush Dooney, the father of the modern homeschool movement, put it this way. He said, dominion does not disappear when a man renounces it. Dominion does not disappear when a man renounces it. It is simply transferred to another party. 
perhaps to his wife, children, employer, or the state. Where the individual surrenders his due dominion, where the family abdicates it, and the worker and employer reduces it, there another party, usually the state, concentrates dominion. Where organized society surrenders power, the mob gains it, proportionate to the surrender. Fancy language for saying, to the same degree that you abdicate, to the same degree and percentage that you relent the reins of power, influence, cultural, political institutions, because you don't want to be perceived as political, it is to that same degree that the secular humanistic revolution who has no problem accruing power will pick up the reins of power to accomplish their father's deeds. This myth of moral neutrality, this myth of like a neutral public square, like we're a pluralistic society, we got to tolerate all things. Yeah, they always start with tolerance. Then they want acceptance. Then they want celebration. And then they demand that you participate in the culture of death. Dominion does not disappear when a man renounces it. It's simply transferred to another party. So what happens when Christians go silent because we're afraid of being smeared in the public square, losing our 501c3 status, losing clients if we're a successful businessman? And hey, hey, that client I have, they might fund abortions, but man, it's a big part of my salary. So I'm just going to stay silent. It's to that degree of abdication that the other side accrues power for their agenda. So, two men two tests, who faced all these same issues before. Did you know in Genesis, Lot is called a righteous man? <laughs> Actually, he's called a righteous man. And where is Lot when the angels come to torch Los Angeles? I saw, saw him uh, in Gomorrah. <laughs> Do you remember he's at the city gates? So Lot is the Christian influencer of his day. He probably had the blue verified, you know, check mark on Twitter and Instagram. He had political sway, authority. He was a respected individual. He was welcoming every foreigner into the land. He was a Christian influencer of his day. So what does he do? He takes the angels to his house. And what does it say in Genesis? It says, men from all parts of the city, all parts of the city came to Lot's house. Every part of culture was descending down onto that one righteous man's house. He was a righteous man. What do they say? Bring those men out. We might have sex with them. Remember? Now listen, Lot was a righteous man. He was willing to sometimes speak the truth. He was willing to critique the spirit of the age and his acolytes to a certain extent. He walks out on his front porch, do you remember? And he says, brothers and sisters... To which I always wanted to say, Lot, stop trying to get crumbs from the table of secular humanism so you can keep your place at the table in a post-Christian regime. They're not your brothers and sisters. They want to have angel sex. Stop trying to get invites to the World Economic Forum from Klaus Schwab. They're not your brothers and sisters. But then he was willing to speak the truth. Seth, Seth, Pastor Shane, get this guy off. I don't really like how he's talking. Listen, he, he, he was a righteous man. He spoke the truth. It, what does he say? Do not do this wicked and abominable thing. He calls their actions wicked and abominable. Boy, we got a lot of Christian influencers, artists, Lecrae, and music artists, and authors today who are willing to criticize the culture of death to a certain extent. They're willing to apply the truth found in the scripture to a pagan mob of a sexualized society to a certain extent. But they only preach as much truth as the spirit of the age allows them to. So they're not deemed a threat to the new regime. There is a reason, there is a reason why Rick Warren gets invited to Davos and Pastor Jack Hibbs does not. There is a reason why when the Washington Post wants the evangelical take on an issue, they approach Russell Moore, the editor-in-chief at Christianity Today, and not Eric Metaxas. There is a reason why David French has a weekly op-ed in the New York Times, and John MacArthur does not. It's the spirit of Lot. 
Do not do this wicked and abominable thing. Hey, church, did you see? I preached against the culture of death. I'm a bold pastor with a chest. What does Lot then say? The testing point of every man is his ability to defend his own. Here are my daughters. Rape them instead. That's what Lot says. What? Do not do this wicked and abominable thing. Now here are my daughters. Wow. Lot was saved, but he wasn't salty. So his wife became in death what he should have been in life. A pillar of salt. Brothers and sisters, what if I told you you can be saved but not salty? You can make it into the kingdom by the hair on your bum. That's biblical. <laughs> Some will make it through as if by fire. You know what that means? Woo! <laughs> means you're getting singed on the way in. What's Lot's story at the marriage supper of the Lamb? Because he's a righteous man. What's Lot's story at the marriage supper of the Lamb? I gave my daughters to be raped by a mob and God forgave me by grace and grace alone. Do you remember, uh, like, there's a list of ten kings in First and Second Kings. And it says, they did what was right in the sight of the Lord. <laughs> they were righteous. They did what was right in the sight of the Lord. They did what was right in the sight of the Lord. It goes through ten kings and says they did what was right in the sight of the Lord. The final epitaph of every one of those kings. I'm talking about the good kings of Israel. The final epitaph of every single one of those men is that, but the high places. But the high places. But the high places. But the high places. Were not taken away. Brother and sister, if you're a new believer, I'm here this morning to tell you that the high places were places of pagan idolatry and worship. They were actually erected in high places, and there they would have orgies to worship Astaroth or Asherah, and they would sacrifice babies to Baal or to Moloch. The way that God remembers the righteous king, see, did what was right on the side of the line, is to say, but you didn't deal with the baby killing. Every single one of those kings is remembered for their inability or unwillingness to stop sacrificing the babies. And that is how they're remembered in glory. But the high places. So you can be like Lot in our culture war today where every part of culture seems to be descending down onto the remnant and to those who are willing to choose obedience over sacrifice. And that's actually the problem in the American church today. The reason that we're here in this position is because we have the spirit of Lot behind most of our pulpits today. Or there's Gideon. You remember Gideon? Gideon's army, dwindling the army down. Remember that whole thing? Well, in Judges 6, did you know he was a little pansy? It's hope for all of us. In Judges 6, Gideon's hiding out in a cave. Why is he hiding out in a cave, Seth? Because they had Bernie Sanders' democratic socialism. <laughs> Don't worry, it's democratic socialism. I've been told that's much better than regular socialism. It's democratic socialism. I think it's something like if you vote your way in, you have to shoot your way out, something like that. But So it says the Midianites are oppressing the Israelites, and though the Israelites thresh their wheat, and what do the Midianites do? They just come and take it. You make, we take. Isn't that a great definition for socialism? <laughs> And so what's Gideon do? He's hiding out in a cave, threshing his own wheat. He's like, screw this, I'm going to keep it. So he's a tax evader. Naughty, naughty Gideon. By the way, Pastor Shane, that's not a theological justification to cheat on your taxes. Please don't mishear me, church. That's not what I'm saying. So Gideon's a little pansy hiding out in a cave. And then it says in Judges 6, it says, the angel of the Lord came to Gideon. And he said, mighty man of valor. No, he's a little pansy. He reminds him of his identity, though, as a son of Issachar, as a son of the king. And so Gideon cooks the God a meal, and the angel of the Lord lights it on fire. 
and Gideon kind of has a Job moment, like, oh, okay, I'm gonna shut up now. Like, yeah, he kind of like, ah, I'm just gonna stop talking, <laughs> stop running my mouth. And then it says, and that same night, this is your homework this morning, go read Judges 6. It says, and that same night, so the same interaction, God says, Gideon, walk out of the cave and go tear down the Baal statues and the Asherah poles. Actually, actually, I want you to chop up the Asherah poles and with the destructed wood of the pagan demon god, I want you to light it on fire and burn me a sacrifice. Uh, god, that's not very peaceful. Um, that's not very respectful and tolerant of other religions. You know, we want the neutral public square. And um, I don't really, that's not very nice. You, that's breaking the 11th commandment. Be nice. <laughs> That's why you'll never hear Rick Warren preach Judges 6 and apply it to the pagan issues of the culture of death today. While he's got Woody and Bo Peep on stage preaching for him at Saddleback. Oh, you guys missed that, sir. I'm not joking. The new pastors Rick Warren hired at Saddleback, one of the first series they did, they came up dressed up as Woody from Toy Story. And Bo Peep, literally the... <laughs> The new senior pastors of Saddleback came dressed up as Woody and Bo Peep and said, welcome to Saddleback. We're going to talk about a sermon series about the gospel uh, aspects of the Toy Story movies. <sighs> no wonder why we're in the position that we're in, in a purpose-driven life. What a joke. Sorry, I got on a tangent there. God chose to deal with the Israelites' abortions before he started with anything else. You know Asherah or Astaroth was the goddess of sex, and so they would worship her through orgies and unbridled sexual liberation. <laughs> what happens when you live that way, though? Uh, you tend to create unwanted babies. Well, that's why you've got Baal and Moloch. It says in the Old Testament, I think it's Deuteronomy, that they sacrifice children, babies to Baal. Moloch too, but... So, if you do the weird orgy stuff to the Asherah, Astaroth, well, when an unwanted baby gets created, we have another, we have another plan for it. Just walk over to the Baal statues and pass the child through the fire. Did you know today Planned Parenthood is not only the largest abortion provider in the world, they're the largest provider of the pornographic, comprehensive sexuality education in America's public schools that have brought all those mama bears and papa bears to school board meetings. Have you seen that in the last two years, all the parents speaking at school board meetings? They're angry. They're pissed. Righteous indignation. Why? Because it's, guys, I actually have the unfortunate job description of like knowing this stuff and studying it. I've gone through the curriculum that they can check out at school libraries, but sometimes it's actually in the sex ed health week, in the curriculum, in the classrooms, not just at a library. It's pornographic cartoons. It's like how to do it all, all the good, all the weird stuff. Who sees it? Can you say conflict of interest? The largest abortion provider in the world, Planned Parenthood is the largest provider of the pornographic comprehensive sexuality education in America's public schools. Sex ed is their sales funnel. Abortion is their product, and your children are their prospects. It's a sales funnel. The left understands how powerful of a driver sex is. Hey, I'm not Alfred Kinsey. I don't believe we're sexual beings. Go listen to my podcast if you want more on that. But sex is a powerful aspect of our human nature. That's why pornography, sexually addicted individuals are not free, they're enslaved. We have, a, we have more sexual pornography addiction in America today than at any other time in human history or in American history. So what does that do? It makes you easier to control. Because if you indulge and satisfy every sexual animalistic appetite that you have, whether it could be food, drugs, alcohol, sex, feed me, feed me, you're not free, you're a slave. And therefore, you're easier to manipulate and control in this out-of-control culture of death. As it was in Judges 6, so it is today. Who are the two pagan gods of American culture today? Sex and child sacrifice. Child sacrifice. They all. 
and Asherah. The more things change, the more they stay the same. And how did God deal with that culture of death? What did he tell his mighty men of valor to do? Tear it all down. Tear down the Baal statues. Tear down the Asherah poles. And he does. And so the following morning when the Israelites and the Midianites wake up, they go, where did our demon gods go? And they call out Gideon's dad. And they say, hey, your son Gideon did this. Bring him out so that we can kill him. If you're not taking shots, you're not over the target. Gideon's taking shots from the pagan sexualized culture because he's right over the target of their pagan gods, deities, and sacraments. Abortion is the sacrament of Satan. Because abortion says you must die so I can live. But Christ says, no, I must die so you can live. There's a reason why the central phrase of the entire culture of death today is the phrase, this is, this is my body. My choice. Because the serpent told me in Genesis 3, if I ate the apple, I'd get woke. For God doth know that, that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be. You understand, Eve eating the apple is the first woke story. That's the beginning of wokeness. That's the beginning of paganism and humanism. Did God really say, are you sure? Because he's holding out on you. He doesn't want you to see reality for how it really is. But if you, oh, then you'll see. And then ye shall be as gods. And a God gets to decide who lives and who dies. But it's actually worse than that, my dear brothers and sisters. Rather than accepting the broken body and shed blood of Christ for eternal life, the architects of our culture of death today demand that we break the bodies and shed the blood of babies for eternal life. At this point, you're probably like, you either love me or you're like, I'm never coming back to this church. You're like, that is so freaking weird. That makes no sense, Seth. You're really weird. Okay. Have you ever heard of embryonic stem cell research? Have you ever heard of fetal organ harvesting or fetal tissue research? And then in 2020, our scientific follow the science institutions announced that they were experimenting with prenatal gene editing. Here's what that is. Conceive babies in test tubes and labs and petri dishes, deny them the right to their mother's uterus, and then poke and prod and ed edit their gene code. The baby dies in the process, but hey, they become an acceptable sacrifice on man's pursuit for eternal life. Because if we can edit the gene code and, and, and we can perfect it on the little baby sacrifices, then once it's safe, we can apply it on ourselves and edit out of our gene code what? Susceptibilities to diseases and disorders. So we can live just a little bit longer. So, do you think it's a coincidence that the words of our Savior at the First Communion are the same words? This is my body. But I break it for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. For I will not eat of this bread or drink of this vine until I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Both abortion and transgender mutilation are defended by Planned Parenthood and the culture of death today with bodily autonomy arguments. Can I summarize bodily autonomy arguments for you? This is my body. All human conflict is ultimately theological. Abortion is Satan's flagrant, flaunting attempt to mock your Savior. He goes, I'm even going to have them quote Jesus by saying, this is my body. 
But Christ says, I willingly break it for you, but abortion says, this is my body and I break your body for me. Both embryonic stem cell research, fetal organ harvesting, fetal tissue research, and prenatal gene editing, what's the common denominator? You must die so I can learn to live longer. Eternity is written on the heart of man. Yes, it's good to want to defeat death. 1 Corinthians 15, 26 says, the last enemy to be defeated is death. That's, that's an eternal longing we have. C.S. Lewis says, you never met a mere mortal. We want to defeat death. That's a godly instinct you have. The sacrifice was already given. The solution to child sacrifice in America is a child sacrifice. It's already provided for you on Calvary. Now, repent and believe for the kingdom of God is at hand. But no, they say, I must break the bodies and shed the blood of babies for eternal life. I'm going to spit on that God man on the cross because I want salvation on my own terms. That is what abortion is in America today. That's why Peter Kreeft, the Catholic philosopher, put it this way. Abortion is the demonic parody of the Eucharist. That's why it uses the same holy words. This is my body, but with the opposite blasphemous meaning. Those babies go to heaven, but God's plan for those children has been thwarted by the enemy of our souls. Satan would kill God if he could, but he can't, so he kills babies because he knows it wounds the heart of the Father and causes chaos on the earth. Listen, if this is part of your story, brother or sister, I'm not here to shame and condemn you this morning. As a believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ, I believe that Jesus is just as eager to forgive the sin of abortion as any other sin. Abortion is not a blacklist sin that removes you from the grace of God, but I will call it child sacrifice to demons. That's because that's what God calls it, actually. In Psalm 106, God says, you've sacrificed your sons and daughters to demons. This is a direct quote. The land is desecrated with blood. And so I give you over to be ruled by those who hate you. Psalm 106, because of the baby killing. And by the way, God sees no distinction between the dignity and value of, of human beings in the womb and the dignity and value of human beings outside the womb. That's why in Luke 1, when the prenatal John the Baptist is doing backflips in the uterus, it says, and the baby, what, leaped in Elizabeth's womb? The Greek word is berephos, B-R-E-P-H-O-S. The berephos leaped in Elizabeth's womb. Turn to Luke 2, one chapter later, Jesus is now born. He's now an infant. He's no longer in utero. And it says, Mary laid berephos Jesus in the manger. The same Greek word is used by the authors of Scripture who were written as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The same Greek word is used to refer to babies in the womb and babies outside the womb. Because your father sees no distinction in value, dignity, and a right to life between children in the womb and children outside the womb. So yes, it's pagan sacrifice to demons, but if it's part of your story and you have not been healed and redeemed yet, do not leave here this morning under a weight of shame and guilt and condemnation. And let me just remind you, by the way, of the gospel. Remember King David? A man after God's own heart. Do you know his other title? Peeping Tom. <laughs> Bathsheba. Ooh la la. Voyeurism, evil, horrible, disgusting, decides that uh, enjoying her visually is not enough. So what, what? He sleeps with her, impregnates her, and murders her husband. King David arranged the death of an innocent human being to hide and cover up his own sexual sin. Maybe you arranged the death of an innocent human being to hide and cover up your sexual sin, but whatever the reason was, the end result was the same. An innocent human being, a child, a person was killed. But if there was grace for King David, there's grace for you. The prophet Nathan confronts David regarding his sin. He briefly justifies it. Then he hits his knees in repentance, and God accepts his repentance as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to him. But there were still consequences to David's sin. God strikes the child dead. Do you remember it? And David says, my son will not return to me, but I will go to him. That is the promise from the scriptures, brother and sister, that if you repent of your abortion and approach the throne of grace boldly, not only is he faithful and just to forgive you, cleanse you from all unrighteousness, and use you as a mighty man or woman of valor, 
but it means that you're going to see your baby in heaven again one day. And they are seated on the lap of the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords waiting to welcome you into eternal glory. So hear that and receive that and don't leave here this morning under more shame and condemnation because the culture and the church actually needs you healed and redeemed because we need your voice to proclaim truth in an out-of-control culture of death because you've been down into the valley of the shadow and now walked out healed and redeemed. You can be a voice for these children. Lot or Gideon. The two options for the church and the culture are that we don't want to engage in because we don't want to harm our Christian witness or lose our 501c3 status. Which way, Christian man? So let's finish with a story. A story of Christian resistance. I've told you the evil aspects of the culture of death, but we need hope, don't we, in these evil times? And we need to look at the men and women who have gone before us who stood in a day like today and were faithful, were unwavering in their obedience, to emulate those in the great cloud of witnesses who were cheering us on, saying, stop being a coward. Stop being a lot. Be a Gideon. Give God a reason. Give God a reason to show California mercy. You know the name's Bonhoeffer. You know the name's Oscar Schindler, but almost no one knows the names Hans and Sophie Scholl. Kids in their 20s in the Third Reich facing the same eugenics culture of death we're facing in America today. If you want to go watch my sermon from Jack Hibbs in 2022, you can get all of this that I just skipped this morning. It's a detailed history of the culture of death and the sexual revolution and Planned Parenthood. Go watch it. The point is, Planned Parenthood was not just part of the eugenics movement, they were the eugenics movement. And the eugenics movement was about good genes and, and the Ubermenschen, Uber, Ubermenschen, master race, and getting rid of the Untermenschen, Untermenschen, subhuman. So Planned Parenthood's first board member, Lothrop Stoddard, inspired the Nazi term Untermensch because Planned Parenthood's first board member's book was named The Menace of the Underman, and the Nazi's chief racial theorist, Alfred Rosenberg, got the title Untermensch, subhuman, as the German translation from underman. So yes, you heard me correctly. The Nazis got the term subhuman from the book written by Planned Parenthood's first board member. If you want the detailed history of all this stuff, go look it up. My point is this. They were facing the same eugenics evil and culture of death we're facing. It was the Jews then. It's unborn babies now. And notice how they now come for anyone who will be like Gideon and start tearing down those high places. They'll call for your head too, which is why they're coming for parents. That's why Planned Parenthood says children, uh, parents are a barrier to service. It's why they're attacking parental notification laws. Because if you stand against those pagan demonic sacraments, they'll call for your head too. What did you do to our pagan demon gods? Same stinking thing. Okay. In 1942, the same year Margaret Sanger changed her name of her organization from the Birth Control League to Planned Parenthood to deflect criticism from her involvement in eugenics because Hitler gave the phrase eugenics a little bit of a negative connotation. Just a... And, and her, her, her work inspired the Nazis with a lot of their eugenics legislation in Germany. So she's like, I gotta change the name of my organization. That same year, 1942, a 21-year-old young woman named Sophie was walking the streets of Munich, Germany. She was a believer. She loved the Lord. Her father spent some time in prison for publicly criticizing Hitler. So like me, she came from good stock. She was horrified at what was happening. And she found a leaflet on the ground in 42, and it said, Leaflets of the White Rose. She picked it up and it was explicitly condemning the crimes of the Nazis. It said things like, if you know, why do you not act? These leaflets said, we are the white rose resistance. We are your bad conscience and we will not leave you alone. They said, do not hide your cowardice behind the cloak of expediency. Oh, you were ready for that one. That, that dog will hunt. That's what evangelical pastors need to be told in America today. Do not hide your cowardice behind the cloak of expediency. 
her heart was stirred to action. She wanted to join the White Rose Resistance. Guess what this 21-year-old Sophie and the namesake of my third child was thinking? She was thinking, my brother Hans talks like this at dinner all the time. It almost sounds like something he wrote in one of his rants, his righteous rants. Come to find out, the White Rose Resistance had not only been co-founded, it was being run by none other than her older brother, Hans. And we have pictures of them this morning, a 24-year-old young man who just wanted to protect his little sister. Hans is on the left, Sophie's in the middle. She demanded to join the White Rose Resistance. Hans understood how dangerous political resistance was to the Third Reich in 42. He didn't want his sister involved. She becomes the youngest member and the only woman of the White Rose Resistance. And for the rest of 42, they stayed up late writing, printing, and distributing their anti-Nazi leaflets all around Germany. They would take trains in the middle of the night to, to Berlin and to Frankfurt and to other cities, dropping their leaflets all around the public. And the Nazis hated the White Rose Resistance, but they didn't know who was behind it. And in 1943, they took things to the next level. So, 81 years ago, this month, February 18th, 1943, Hans and Sophie took things to the next level, and they walked onto the campus at the University of Munich. How many of you know that the universities, like the clergy, had been co-opted into silence or obedience by the Nazi state? This was a dangerous thing to do, and they walked the halls of the university during class time and they started spreading their illegal leaflets all around the university. I was just there in December. We're filming for my film that will blow the top off of the demonic sexualized moral revolution called the 1916 Project. Comes out in June. 1916, the first brick and mortar Planned Parenthood clinic. Anyways, Sophie then took things to the next level and she walked to the third floor balcony of the University of Munich and she started throwing hundreds of leaflets three floors down to the atrium below. The janitor, a committed Nazi, caught Sophie in the act, called the Gestapo on the spot, and Hans and Sophie were arrested on February 18th, 1943. So 81 years ago in a couple weeks. They spent four days in prison being brutally interrogated and physically abused and they refused to implicate or rat out any of their other friends or members of the White Rose Resistance. Unfortunately, they found incriminating evidence of a leaflet in Hans's pocket that was written by Christoph Probst on the right, who they did not want at the university that day because his wife was in the hospital recovering from childbirth for a child he'd never meet. They were all in their 20s. They were all in their 20s. Four days later, they had their heads chopped off. In those four days, I believe, our Savior spoke prophetically through Sophie. I believe God gave her a level of spiritual and political clarity that transcended the pulpits of Germany at the time. And I believe she's speaking prophetically to the church today and the White Rose Resistance. My organization is now the fastest growing pro-life organization in America because we're trying to put ourselves out of a job by reawakening the blood-bought bride of Christ to be salty again. And so, because her cellmate recorded her final days and wrote letters to Hans and Sophie's parents months after they were killed, telling them every final moment of their daughter's life, we know what she was thinking and saying in those days leading up to her beheading. so important to disciple godly children, brothers and sisters. They were raised by such good parents that Hans and Sophie's father broke into the courtroom during their hearing by Roland Freiser, the people's court, insane, just like sent everyone to the guillotine. He, Roland Freiser sent 90% of the people who came before him to be murdered. This is no, this is no public hearing. This is no fair jury. Their father broke into the courtroom. And as he was escorted away, Hans and Sophie's father yelled at those Nazis and he said, you will one day stand where they sit now in the judgment seat. 
The prison guards were so disturbed by these siblings' bravery and calm in the face of death that the prison guards relaxed the rules and let Hans and Sophie meet with their parents in a side room right before being taken to the guillotine. And Sophie's mother looked at her doomed daughter and said, Remember Jesus, Sophie. And do you know what this 21-year-old said back to her mother? Yeah, but you too, Mama. You too. Here were some of Sophie's final words, and I believe she's asking the question we're asking right now in California, (laughs) which is what the heck is going on? How did this happen, and where is the church? Here's what she said. She said, did I tell you she's 21? She said, the real damage is caused by all of those millions out there who just want to survive. It's the honest men and women who just want to be left in peace. Those who don't want their little lives disturbed by anything bigger than themselves. Those with no sides and no causes. Those who won't take measure of their own strength. Do we have strength, church? But we don't take measure of that own strength for fear of antagonizing our own weaknesses. Those who don't like to make waves or enemies. Those for whom freedom, honor, truth, and principle. It's just words. It's just literature. Lot. Those who live small, die small. It's the reductionistic approach to life. Because church, if you keep it small, you'll keep it under control. Because if you don't make any noise, (laughs) the boogeyman won't find you. FBI, Department of Homeland Security. But it's all an illusion. It's all an illusion. Because they die too. You know those people who who they, 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 they roll up their spirits into tiny little balls so as to be safe. Sophie said, safe! From what? Life is always on the edge of death. Narrow streets, guess what? They lead to the same place as wide avenues. And a little candle burns itself out just like the flaming torch does. I choose my own way to burn. Okay, who talks like that at 21? Can we just say that really quickly? That sounds like G.K. Chesterton or Winston Churchill. That's a young woman with the lion of the tribe of Judah roaring inside of her to say, get off the bench, get onto the field of battle for your king and watch how I'll move through my bride because obedience, it's so much better than sacrifice. As she was escorted out of her prison cell, her cellmate said that these were the final things she heard Sophie say. Her cellmate, Elsie Gebel, who survived the Holocaust, said, Sophie said, how can we expect righteousness to prevail when there's hardly anyone willing to give themselves up individually to a righteous cause? Such a fine sunny day it is. And I have to go now. But what does my death matter? If through us, thousands of people are awakened and stirred to action. But they weren't, and Hitler's genocidal agenda continued for another two and a half years. But I'm here this morning to tell you that while rose blossoms may perish in the fall, they reappear in the spring. And while all of the members of the White Rose Resistance were found and executed, their sacrifice planted the good seeds of resistance in the hearts of millions whose actions today are keeping alive the legacy of the White Rose Resistance. And your sacrifice, my brothers and sisters, will water those seeds of resistance. What's the line? The seed of the church is the blood of the saints. They died and went to glory, but their obedience has incited millions to find courage in their days and culture of death today. Because they were killed on February 22nd, 1943, they missed a meeting they had scheduled the next week in Germany. Five days later, a meeting they never made. That meeting was with Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the founder of the Confessing Church in Germany. 
who was murdered for his involvement in the Valkyrie plot to try to take the life of Hitler. The executioner said, was interviewed, and he said Sophie's final words were, the sun still shines. And he said Hans's final words were, freedom, freedom, like William Wallace. Reminds me of Bonhoeffer's final words, hung naked at Flossenburg Prison on April 15, 1945. This is the end. <laughs> For me, the beginning of life. I am rebuilding the White Rose Resistance for this generation against our silent but far more deadly holocaust of abortion before it's too late. We exist to put ourselves out of a job because I don't want to be tearing down high places at 40 years old. I want to be rebuilding Christendom to give God a reason to show California mercy. So what are we doing as the fastest growing pro-life organization in America? We're developing resistance circles all around the country to train and mobilize believers of all ages to walk out of their little Gideon caves and start being mighty men and women of valor to equip them with the education, resources, and leadership from our growing organization to end child sacrifice in America. And if they come for our heads, Let's say the sun still shines, spelled S-O-N. The hour could not be later, brothers and sisters. But it's not about us. It's not about our gun rights and our free speech rights, and I just want to protect my rights so my kids can live more comfortably. Yeah, that's great. But that's not why we do what we do. We do what we do because we've been told to. Proclaim the truth with boldness and grace. Believe the results to God. Let the chips fall where they may. We're going to be faithful. So if you want to join the White Rose Resistance, <laughs> we need your help. My friend Charlie Kirk says there's the fighters and the people who help the fighters. And without the, fight, the people who help the fighters, there are no fighters. But we're trying to mobilize you to be the Christian resistance because we don't need another 501c3. We need Christians being Christians actually. So scan the QR code. We have it up here. If you join at $35 a month, yes, we need your support. We know about Biden inflation, Bidenomics. It's r really rough. I saw the gas prices, okay? But if you can do $35 a month, you get a free shirt when you leave today, a hug from me, a bear hug to one of my favorite congregations in California, and you get a resistance box sent to you in the mail, and you join our digital community online that you'll be invited to in your email, where like live calls with me, maybe Eric Metaxas shows up sometime, maybe Jack Hibbs, I don't know. Live calls, courses, curriculum training for you to be the resistance. If you join at $70 a month, you join our book club. So we read a book together once a month and we talk about it live on Zoom. Anyways, I'm just trying, yes, I'm trying to get a cookie cookie, but like it, it's to equip and mobilize you. It helps, it helps us put, run the, the operation. Okay, if you join, show us the QR code, show us the sheet, show us your phone at the table, get a free shirt, give me a hug. I will see you on the battlefield. Now go out there and give them heaven. <laughs>